Podcast. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors Podcast, with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to the next episode of The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors, with the wonderful Mr. Bob Cook and myself, Jackie Jones. And in this episode, we're going to be looking at what can we learn from the past for the future of psychotherapy. What an interesting title. Yeah, it's got many different layers to it. I've just had a massage and I've come back very relaxed. Good. So I'm full of energy to explore this riveting topic, but it has different dimensions to it. Not only about um, where psychotherapy is going in terms of uh, away from relational psychotherapy, for example, but we could talk about that dimension later. But the this this dimension I want to talk about is most psychotherapies today. I'm not talking about CBT here particularly. Many of the um, developmental therapies, yeah. transaction analysis, psychodynamic, we could talk about other disciplines as well, come from the position that the past affects the present, which of course then may or have the potential to affect the future. Yes. So there's that whole dimension to talk about, uh, which is probably where I'll start. Um, but there's a lot more to talk about in terms of uh, relational psychotherapy versus some of the more digital psychotherapies. Let's put it that way. Yeah, yeah. Which... And I know we've spoken in the past or you've spoken in depth at the past about the changes that you've seen in psychotherapy and I think we touched on it I'm not sure which podcast but quite recently about you know we kind of follow suit from America and changes that happen over there well certainly if we go back it to evolves Freud, over time doesn't it that's right now a new film has just come out recently or coming out put that way I don't know if it's out yet um where F it's called Freud's Last Session oh interesting and uh it's Hopkins, Anthony Hopkins, who plays Freud, and um, a very well-known person plays C.S. Lewis, and they're talking about existential issues in the world of um, psychoanalysis, psychotherapy. I don't think it's come out yet, but it's supposed to be very good. But let's go back to Freud, if we're talking about the past. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, do, we go back to sort of, I don't know, 1888 books Freud's book on hysteria when he's talking about drive theory talks about instincts talk about um interpretation um uh, being the major mechanism for, for psych the new psychoanalysis and a lot of the psychoanalysis was of course aimed at the first two or three years of somebody's life and through free interpretation sorry through um basically just sort of uh Free association, that's the word I want. Um, the analyst would make no more than three interpretations. Um, and then those interpretations were lodged so powerfully that the patient, um, if they followed them, uh, there was a curative effect, put it that way. Um, so that sort of psychoanalysis, it wasn't anything about being in the relationship at yeah. all. In fact, it was the opposite. Yeah. But as time went on, um, we go up to the 1940s, 1950s, um, people talk more about moving away from drive theory and instinct theory and looking between the therapist and the client. And by the 1990s, uh, we followed suit or we started to learn from the past because Freud died an unhappy man, really because um, a lot of the decisions that were taken or via interpretation, if you like, put it that way, didn't actually stick or didn't actually um, have the curative effect that he thought things would have. Yeah. So we get to 1990, we start to see psychotherapy flourish, if you like, in the relational world where 
the relationship is the curative factor for growth. And now we're on 2024, well, most psychotherapies um, follow that thought process that the relationship is the curative factor for growth. Yeah. Uh, so we've learned from the past in that way, if you like. And of course, that will then affect, well, it does affect the future because, as I say, if you go to a psychotherapy bookshop, most most books, not if not all books, uh, will talk about the relationship being the curative factor, the human encounter being yeah. so important to emotional growth. So we have learned from the past, uh, and that then affects the present, which, of course, affects the future of where we are now. Where we go on from now, of course, is another whole big story with the birth of chatbot or yeah. another way you know artificial intelligence or absolutely yeah. algorithms or digital um ways of looking at psychotherapy so let's let's say that you know some of the you've got two really parts of the debate uh one is the importance of human encounter and i think the past has taught us that in the world yeah. of psychotherapy yeah. Yeah. And hopefully that will affect where psychotherapy goes and we hang on to human encounter and relationship psychotherapy as the, or the relationship as the curative factor. And on the other side of the debate, you've got the, which is run, which is really fueled by money rather than I think uh, uh, other things to do with mental health and health issues. It's, well, you, we, we, we can provide you with a sort of a chat bot or artificial intelligence um so you'll be able to i don't know phone up or or, or actually have a tablet that you'll talk to which will tell you how to deal with depression yeah yeah like a chat box you know you know what chat bot is yeah, you know, AI, yeah, yeah, yeah. google and you will be talking to more of the artificial artificial intelligence robotic area if you like which will give us a sort of i don't know if we want to call it therapy therapy by rote for dealing with depression or eating disorders or whatever it is and if we follow that algorithm then we'll get better so the human encounter bit is left out of the equation yeah which is sad <laughs> I oh. watched something, I, I, it must have been about six months ago, 12 months ago or whatever, on, on television about, I, I think it was in China or somewhere, where they'd got a little robot that, you know, was sent out to people and, it, it you know, they could talk to it and it was meant mm -hmm. to make them feel better. And, you know, it, even the way that its face was, was like empathic and whatever. And it was like, wow, is that where we're heading? <laughs> well, if we are, I don't think we've learned from the few. I don't think we've learned from the past. No. Because most of the research I read talks about the importance of the human encounter and the relationship as a curative factor for mental health. Yeah. Not the reverse. See, I think the reverse, what you're talking about there, um, and also what i was listening to the other day in uh, i can't remember which state in america where they were building these like you've just said these robots but they hadn't quite got or devised yet an empathy chip mm. the program was talking about would we ever get an empathy chip yeah for, for the robots and i'm sure we will by the way so but i don't think that that process, cutting out the human encounter, is particularly good for the cure of mental health. No. But, you know, you touched on it earlier on about, you know, it's all about the money or whatever. A lot of it is, I think. Yeah, but even, I, I think COVID maybe played a part in it as well because you know i i never worked online prior to covid i was adamant that i wouldn't work online it was always going to be face to face and then suddenly covid hit so i started working via zoom mm. and I, I think you know it opened up a whole new world you know not only was i 
seeing people from my local area, but I was seeing people in Germany and Spain and all over the place all of a sudden. But then there's something about the waiting lists with that, you know, face-to-face contact or whatever that I think at some point they're going to do something where it is more online and by rote and following a certain procedure and maybe having people that aren't as qualified. Well, there is the birth of what's called online therapy or Zoom therapy. However, you do talk to a human being. Yeah, yeah. So I'm not a fan of online therapy, by the way, but if I was... I would still be there at the end of you'd be able Absolutely. to see. It. Yeah, yeah. Have, maybe maybe you might want to say a diluted process of the human encounter, but at least there would be, you know. But it's uh, like you say, you know, you can do it via text now or phone call. Do you know what I mean? And that's different because you don't see the person, do you? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So i I understand in in the service of accessibility. Uh, in the service of waiting lists, et cetera, et cetera, uh, maybe online therapy that includes the human person. Yeah. As being perhaps advantageous, if you like. Um, but when we, when we move to, say, robots with empathy chips or robots or chatbots with algorithms, for the person to follow without any contact with a human person i think well i'm not so sure that that that, that is healthy in terms of the curative factor when we talk about mental health issues yeah or if it is it's a damn side slower yes and it's out a whole process which is the proximity to another human being yeah. Yeah, because it's different. You, 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 I, I don't know if it's a physical problem. You can go through a scanner or, you know, have these quick x rays where people can see because, you know, there's something happening in your body and it can be picked up. But with mental health, it's completely different. Oh, absolutely. So if the future is robots with empathy chips or AI with algorithms that you follow, um, or portals, any of those processes which don't include human encounter or relationship. I think it's a, it will be a different type of therapy that we had in the past and yeah. not one I would favour. Yeah, no. Me now, if I was to visit the plant in 50 years' time, say, um, and we looked at how psychotherapy is, if the term is even around anymore. Um, I, I'm sure it'd be short into therapy anyway. Um, I'm not sure, talking to you on this podcast, what type of future I would be seeing. Yeah. If we go back to the past and we hold dear the importance of relationship and close proximity to human encounter, as a curative factor in mental health issues, then we'll have, then I think I might see a different future. Yeah. Do you think I know, like you've spoke about integrative psychotherapy, and do you think there's going to be some sort of merging of different types of wellness, even more so than what we have now? <coughs> what I what I fear. As I sit in the United Kingdom 2024 talking to you, um, we already have a broken NHS. Yeah. We already have massive waiting lists. We already have um, therapy that is offered, which is CBT, which doesn't take into account the past particularly. We already have all the things you just talked about, text therapy, online therapy, phone therapy, all these different things. So we have all that and the mental health system is crumbling. So, you know, I take your point on one side earlier on where you said, well, 
as a way to resolve some of those issues. No, you didn't say it this way, but I think that was the assumption that we can halve the waiting list lists, or we can make sure that any therapy that's offered is just six sessions, because if you follow this algorithm, the yeah. depression will get better. Yeah. Or if you follow what the chatbot says to the T, therapy won't be very long. You know, there won't be many sessions, you will get better. Um, are we going to see more of that, which is money driven to save money? I basically think, will the insurance companies uh, insist on that type of process we're talking about or not? I don't know. I fear that that type of future may be more on the cards because of where we're going in terms of the mental health system being broken, the orientation on money, the orientation of outcomes, the um, CBT programs, which are, you know, you know, almost like therapy by log and wrote in my view are we going to see that type of future is it, <laughs> when you said then about you know following a certain process and in eight sessions you know you'll be cured of depression or whatever it is is mm. that a possibility because we're all unique we, we, we're individual and that's the whole point in my mind of therapy it's not you go in a you know, a, a funnel this end and come out the other end and everything's okay. And it's like, you know, a procedure that you follow in my mind. I think I understand completely because I come from that past, if you like, that sort of period of individual psychotherapy and the importance of relationship psychotherapy and security fact and everything else. What I was saying on the other side though, is are we heading towards more formulaic, formulaic, where everything's a formula? Yeah, yeah. And if you follow this formula, you'll get better, rather than what you've just said, attending to the unique differences of the human person, spending a year or two years in psychotherapy with somebody, um, understanding the very nuances of how they become the way they are, which will leave the cure. I, more and more, I look around what's happening in the NHS and various different other places. There's much more a push towards a more formula process. Yeah. Of 10 sessions or 12 sessions. I mean, if you went to the NHS yesterday, you'd be lucky to get more than 12 sessions. Absolutely. In CBT, yeah. in CBT. Yeah. might go a bit cat cognitive analytical therapy might give you 70, but we're cutting down and cutting, cutting down. It's less and less. So you know, with the cash problems we've got, the cost problems we've got, the NHS, which needs to cut down the long, long waiting list, all these sorts of things are calling for a much more formula-led process, yeah. I think, for therapy, unfortunately. So I don't think we will be learning from the past. I think we will, could be channeled out like a formula for eating disorders or a formula for depression or a formula for CBT or a formula for anxiety or a formula for ADHD. Will we ever see a human being if I visited this planet in 50 years when we're dealing with mental health issues? I don't know. I see. It's a, it's a, <laughs> a grim, I don't know, thing to think about, isn't it? I don't favour it. What because else can we do, though, good. Bob? What, what you know, the the well, the way that things are and the way that mental health. I think if it goes that, that way, way, if it goes that way, much more, we're certainly not learning from the past, <clears throat> because the past shows us that the curative factors for health, mental health, is human encounter and relationships, not formulas given out by an AI chatbot. Yeah. What about prevention rather than cure? <laughs> well, you know, I know we've got an election coming along soon, and I know the Labour Party are talking about now, as we speak, in the future, talking about if they win the next election, they will uh, very soon implement what we call early interventions in schools. 
where every school has a counselor or a mentor that deals with behavioral problems. Now, I like that vision of the future. Yeah. So there are some things that we can learn from the past and, and take, you know, into the future with us, like, you know, preventative measures and, and things like that. And, you know, encouraging the power of relationship in the therapeutic rather than, you know, wiping them out to encourage more of it. Encouraging more and more of it. I absolutely agree with you. That's why I like the manifesto that includes a counsellor, a human person in every school. Yeah. I like the idea of early interventions before some of these mental health issues take insidious hold. Yeah. We certainly can learn from the path, past in all the ways we're talking about this. And on the other side of the fence, you've got the people saying, well, this will cost a lot of money. Yes, but it's it's where you put that money, either at the beginning or at the end. <laughs> I am very much a favour of relationship psychotherapy. I'm very much a favour of early interventions. Yeah. I'm very much a favour of a counsellor of being in every school and behavioural mentors, preventative action that you're talking about. And I think the past would show us that that's the way forward. Is there still research being done into all of this as to what works and what doesn't? Yes, and it depends what research you read. Well, yeah, there is, there's always that. No, no. <laughs> it's yeah. the same with every bloody thing. It depends which research paper you read. Yeah. You know, but I would say that all the research I've read, and as I say, if you go to a psychotherapy bookshop, all the books that you will read will be talking about the importance of relationship in the curative factor. So there's much written, there's much research done saying that please don't lose the sight of relationship with another human person being the major way of curing mental health issues. Yeah. Now I know that because I did the assessments at the Institute and, you know, we might have 12, 14, 20 people a month, if you like, and I do the assessments. None of them, none of them. And I repeat, none, and I know you do online therapy, so I don't want to denigrate that. But want to have, it, have online therapy. They all want to have face-to-face Absolutely, um, yeah. yeah. And I, I do that now. You, do you know what I mean? It, through COVID and everything, I was doing the online stuff. And it's only now people that I started to see online that live too far away that I do online therapy. But my chosen one is is face to face. Absolutely. 100%. So we have to that. learn. We have to learn from the research of the 90s and the early 2000s that relationship psychotherapy integrative psychotherapy in the relationship with another person is the premium way yeah of cure of help uh, of health health and mental health issues if we don't take that on board our future will be very different yeah I think. but it is with it's not just mental health with physical health as well do you know what i mean the the our physical health impacts on us mentally and mentally impacts on us physically. You know, and I just have a massage. Been, absolutely, yeah. And I think that's what I mean by, you know, different approaches coming together, you know, yeah. and, and working together. But it's been proven that that human connection makes us feel better physically, never mind the mental yeah. side of things, that connection. I, I, I couldn't agree more and we both come from a TA background that talks about, about the importance the imperative importance of um, what you're talking about here it's like a biological imperative absolutely in terms of recognition hunger yeah so I'm completely on board and that's what I'm saying if we don't learn from this then we have a different future ahead where my massage might be by a robot. Yeah. It's not good, that, Bob, is it? <laughs> I would hate it. I would, I enjoy very much the human 
contact. Yeah, it's the conversation. It's everything. It, it's, it, yeah. It's not, it, yeah. I just think that we, without the human contact, it's cold and it's sterile and it's, yeah. It's like you say, it's kind of learning by rote in school. It's just following a certain path. You could go and see any therapist and you're going to get the same treatment on the same week doing the same yeah. thing there's no I individuality I yeah couldn't agree more i did an assessment today and this person has come from depression and they said is it face to face i said yes and she said that's good because i went to the doctor the doctor sent me to some online forms they had to fill in yeah around depression and she said she was felt more depressed after doing it filling in the forms i'm talking about yeah 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 so I'm not a fan at all of the side of just taking you down uh, the, the, the algorithms and the formulas and everything else that goes with it. I think if we go down that path, we certainly haven't learned from, you know, the past of what I'm talking about. Yeah. And I'm, I, I very much support early interventions, like you just talked about, counsellors in every school, you just talked about. And I'm not talking about chatbots or holograms or or whatever talking to the kids I'm talking about people yeah yeah and for me I think you, you know I don't know whether it's because it's something that has interested me but I think we are going in two completely separate directions one is where it's all automated and it's you know via computer and online and everything else but then I think there's a massive shift for looking at things holistically and connecting with nature and getting out and using, you know, therapy in different ways. There's still that human connection, but not being sat in a room. Do you know what I mean? Like walking, talking therapy or, you know, I don't know, art therapy or dance or whatever it is. There's, there's that many different forms now, but it all involves two people or, or more than one person. Let's put it that way. Yeah. And that's what we've learned from the past, I think. That's what I'm saying. The yeah, yeah. birth of equine therapy, for example, the birth yep. of all the things you're talking about. Now we we know that that's the way forward. And I hope we've learned from the past and the present to have a future, which is includes the human encounter. Yeah. I, I just, as you were talking then, I was thinking, I hope it doesn't become... A, a tiered approach where the human connection is the e exclusivity of it that's private and paid for and then do you know what I mean there's like a, a, a lower tier where it is get them in and get them out well look at dentists yeah no exactly what you just said we have a total collapse of NHS dentistry if you can pay money, you can have private dentistry where you've got somebody you can go and see fairly quickly and easily and accessible, someone you will talk to, somebody who will be at the cutting edge of dentistry to look after your teeth. If you haven't got money, you go on a large waiting list yeah. and see an NH dentist. And there's nothing wrong with an NH dentist. They're often the very people who are in the private sector as well. But the problem is they're not so accessible. They take quite a long time to, you know, for you to get to see, be seen by them. Um, so you're right. There is two tier processes which have emerged. Yeah. Many different areas. So I, I certainly hope psychotherapy does not go that way. Well, I if it did, not. we would learn nothing. We will learn nothing from the past if it went no. that way. No, and I hope we've not depressed everybody that's listening. <laughs> no. I mean, there, there are many places around which offer things like low cost therapy, which yes, uh, yeah. I I don't see people. Uh, it's all face to face, and uh, I believe I believe that. The power of the relationship is the curative factor will uh, have a large say here, especially with all the research and all the books that state this, 
my only fear to that is money. Yeah. Well, there the definitely has to be investment. for money. Yeah. Uh, will, you know, will, how can I explain this? Will encourage people or the government or whatever way we look at this to go down a different route. Yeah. And let's go back. To a certain extent, very unfortunately, Jackie, we already have a two-tier system, psychotherapy in this country. Uh, um, now, there are places like myself and other places which do low-cost therapy, £15 an hour. However, fewer and fewer of those places exist in Manchester. Um, we're inundated with people for that therapy. I was just going to say, um, yeah, but even that, the, the, the waiting list must be... All that, all the route. Um, and then there's the, the other way, the other route, which is 50, 60, 70 pound an hour. Yeah. Yeah. So we already, to an extent, have a two tier system. Unfortunately, you know, and, and I'll, let's put the NHS on into the equation. Most people will have to wait a long time. Yeah. Huge waiting list to get NHS therapy. Yeah. So let's not. Let's look at the elephant in the room because we already, to an extent, have two tier therapy. Yeah. Now I, I do my best to investigate that a bit. Yeah. Somebody come to me, you, you know, with, with um, a charity that they access because they've got a health condition, and as part of that, they could access, you know, get some therapy or whatever, and. On five different occasions, they've had five different people visit them at home, filling out the same forms and asking the same questions. And, mm. you know, sort of three months down the line, they still haven't actually seen anybody. So there's kind of like a delaying tactic going on. Just, yeah, we'll get round to it at some point. Yeah. I, uh, I, I say I'm 74 in October, and one of the pressures to keep going, sorry, to not retire, is what we're talking about here, because I, I want to uh, keep low cost clinic going. Yeah. I want to be the champion of relationship, relationship psychotherapy. Um, so I very much um, feel that I'll probably go on longer because I want to keep these things going. But the past, you see, it says all the research shows and many different things. So this so relationship psychotherapy is a curative factor. Now, you know, let's keep that principle and yeah. let's hope that our we can paint a different future from the one I talked a bit about yeah. earlier on. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, Bob, thank you so much. Until next time, when we'll be looking at five things not to do in the therapy process. Oh, nuts and bolts, nuts and bolts of this. I'm sure we'll come up with more than five things because we generally do. <laughs> so until next time, Bob. Yes, goodbye. Bye. You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.